Welcome everyone to the Tuesday night talk. And tonight's topic is going into silence. I'm your host, Elizabeth Padilla, and we are fortunate to have Sister Denise with us for a consecutive, I guess, six more Tuesdays. So please stay tuned for these Tuesday evening talks. Denise is special in many ways. And I would say her honesty and her love for truth and diving deep and also taking that, taking the courage to look in the mirror of that truth. And it's a lovely balance. And with that, tonight's topic is going into silence. And what does that mean to go into silence? So we're going to learn. Is it really to be in a void, <laughs> a nothingness? Let's understand the de deep aspect and how silence is actually, it's actually a power. And for those of you who may not know about Sister Denise Lawrence, she has over 45 years experience with Raj Yoga meditation, and she's been a TV producer, she's open centers, she's um, also um, coordinates international communications with the centers at the Brahma Kumaris headquarters in Mount Abu. So um, she loves to delve into different topics. And so we'll get a chance to in the next series of Tuesdays to, to uh, listen to her and, and experience that wisdom. So without further ado, Sister Denise, welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth, very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very good. Good. Well, um, good evening, everyone. And thank you for being with us for this series of Tuesdays that uh, we are doing from Anabuti Retreat Center. So today I want to talk about going into silence. And first of all, I would like to clarify that there is a huge difference between physical silence and spiritual silence. And most religious people practice physical silence. And so they don't talk, um, they have meals in, silence without talking and they go for walks without talking and they write little notes to each other without talking and they go and sit alone without talking and all of that is um, physical silence and I had um, interrogated some of our very senior yogis who have since passed on to find out what their thoughts were on silence. And um, they said, yes, that's physical silence, but what we do is spiritual silence. And it's really something different. So this is what I'd like to talk about today. So it is um, one, one initial thing to say about it is it is silence of the mind and it doesn't require silence of the voice. Um, so what does it mean to have silence of the mind, even if you are in noise and you are talking if needed? Um, you don't have to talk just unnecessarily, but there is nothing in the practice of spiritual silence that prevents you from speaking. So spiritual silence, uh, which is very much silence of the mind, is connected with uh, silence at the level of feeling and thought and state of being while in the body, in the world of sound and sights and all of the things that we experience through our sense perceptions, but yet 
there is a stillness within while you are in the midst of all of that. And there is a special kind of practice for this, which I would like to introduce you to, uh, which will also, I think, help you to distinguish what really this spiritual silence is about. Now, you hear sounds. There may be someone speaking. There may be ambient sounds. There may be a fire truck passing with their siren. There may be um, music playing somewhere in another building or outside. And these are sounds that you don't have to listen to. You hear, but you don't have to listen. So listening is where your attention is drawn and you focus your attention on that, but you don't have to. So sometimes people experience that they hear something, but they're not able to prevent themselves from listening to it, even though it's actually a distraction from what they need to be focused on at the time. And being distracted is a real issue for a lot of people because we are continuously bombarded with um, with different kind of images and sounds from everywhere. And especially because of social media and the other kinds of media that constantly wanting to pull our attention. And we um, can very easily get addicted to that. And this has come up recently that these algorithms are specially designed to actually make you addicted to that. And that diminishes your ability to be distraction free when you're not engaged in your computer or your social media or your device. So silence of the spirit is very much connected with your power to focus your attention on what you want when you want, if you want, and not if you don't want, and for how long you want. And that power to focus your attention at will is a very key element of spiritual silence. So that's hearing. Then there's also seeing. You see all sorts of things. There's something in your visual focus. There's many things going on in your peripheral vision. And um, you can get distracted and your eyes will go somewhere or somewhere. And when you are distracted, that's when you can get an accident. If driving, for example, that's when you can make a mistake. You can do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, because your attention wasn't held steady on what you wanted and needed to be attentive to. And so this um, susceptibility to get distracted is really the noise that you need to be able to control. And you cannot do that by practicing to stop talking and calling that silence, that's physical silence. So what we're trying to do in Raj Yoga is a very different kind of silence, a deep inner silence that allows you to remain focused on what you need to be focused on when you need to be focused on it the intensity and degree and all of that. And this is called precision attention. And that is a, um, uh, an attribute of spiritual silence. And this is why we talk about silence power. 
So the same applies to sense of smell, sense of touch, temperature, and so on. So your mind and your focus of attention is an indicator of your willpower. And in uh, life, we are constantly receiving sensory input that we have to edit. All the time we must edit. And that includes anything that comes, whether it's someone comes in the room, uh, someone makes a sound, um, something happens, all of those things. It takes a nanosecond for you to become aware of it and make a decision. Do I need to pay attention to this or not? And in that nanosecond, you make your decision, you pay attention if necessary, and you edit it out if not necessary. And the consequence of this is you get a very good power of concentration. And you are also able to be still at times when you do not need to pay attention on something in particular. So if you look at your day from the time when you wake up in the morning and you go through your daily routine and um, just uh, take a minute to sort of look at the CCTV footage of your day and just remember uh, how you pass through your day. And this is a very useful thing to do at the end of the day and evaluate what happened, what were the lessons, uh, was there something of significant, did you use your time well, did you use your heart well, did you make good decisions whenever a decision was needed, because there are many decisions that we have to make during the day, just on just a basic ordinary day, because moment by moment, Anything can happen. <clears throat> uh, and something happens that you need to pay attention to while something else is happening that you also need to pay attention to. So there you get a like a conflict because you have to realize that you can only focus your attention on one thing at a time, but the speed of your mind is very fast if you have your mind under your control. So when you're doing fairly simple things during the day, at any moment, something unexpected can occur. And when that happens, uh, you need to be able to move your mind quickly um, between what you need to be focused on that you're in the middle of doing, and you also have to pay attention on what just happened so that you uh, factor it in to what's happening and you adjust your situation to take it into account while still continuing to do with what you're actually doing at the time when that intervention happened. If it's an intervention that is not needed, uh, that means to say it doesn't require you to pay attention to it, then you just take a nanosecond to notice it, realize you don't have to do anything about it and get back to um, what you are focused on and the amount of time that your mind is somewhere else is really, really quick, which means that your focus of attention is effectively unbroken. <clears throat> if you get pulled by that and you lose your focus of attention on what you're supposed to be doing, something can go wrong with that. And that is called noise. So there's a break in your attention. 
and it's a break in the power of your focus. So that would be called uh, noise. Um, there are sometimes uh, thoughts that arise in your mind and interfere with what you need to be thinking about. And so that is also another kind of noise. Um, one of the um, things that happens to people is um, a kind of self-doubt. And the way it um, pans out is like this. You are doing something, you're minding your own business, doing some normal thing. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, someone may make a remark which triggers a weakness of yours, which is connected with your self-doubt. And if this distracting thing touches one of your wounds, or one of your weaknesses, then it's, um, it, it affects you more than if it was just something that um, comes along that's, that you're neutral about. So this is where you have to really practice the silence. And the silence it has to take the form of okay, here it comes again, this is triggering my weakness, uh, I've got it, uh, understand what's going on, I don't have to actually deal with this at all, because it's just reminding me that I have a wound, but I know I have a wound, and I don't have to deal with this right now, because I am busy dealing with something else, so thank you very much, have a nice day, see you later, and you need a lot of willpower to do that because it touches your feelings and your feelings will bubble around or jump up and down and say oh 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 <laughs> something happened um i can't carry on focusing on what i was focusing on because i have to do this actually you don't and your willpower is also your silence power, which is the power of your decision. Uh, and it's not that you're suppressing your feelings or overriding your feelings, but you're saying to them, okay, I hear you, I feel you, I understand you, I know you very well, and we'll talk about it later, because we can but this is not a good time. And so it's like um, there are many aspects of yourself and you can say many selves within oneself, but there's the real me and that's the, the one in charge, that's the soul, that's the reality. And these other selves are... Um, something like personas that are like peripheral to the real you that have developed in response to uh, wounds or traumas or conditioning or training or so many things are there where there have been um, influences that try to uh, take us over and give us an identity that is not actually our real identity, but which is more like a role that we play or a circumstance that we fell into or a trap or a drama of some sort or another. And then we acquire these secondary personalities um, which vie for our attention and which also vie for position and, uh, and they say to the real me you're not the real me I'm the real me and so we need to one of the reasons why we practice meditation is to find ourselves and know ourselves 
and not allow any of these subsidiary personalities to take over because they are not real. And another um, word for them is a false ego. But um, there, there are quite big problems around this because we come into circumstances where we are under the influence of parents, teachers, spouse, um, professional uh, forming, uh, formation, uh, educators, um, and all of these will say to us, this is who you are, and this is how you have to be. Some of them form like alter egos, and some of them will try to diminish us, and we get into a very low self-esteem, and we think that that is me. Some of them push us up. We get into very high feeling, and we think that is me. And so all of these um, personas and roles, they are not me. And silence is really about being me, with me, as me, and this is who I am. And then all these other subsidiary selves, which for many years may be under different uh, circumstances, you have been receiving messages from people that this is you, this is you, this is you, you are good, you are bad, you are worthy, you are unworthy, you are stupid, you are whatever it happens to be. And this begins in early childhood. And um, uh, there are very few people who grow up where they're allowed to be themselves and where their actual self is um, supported and validated, usually it's diminished and devalued and invalidated. And then it's a big piece of work to actually find yourself again and neutralize all that stuff. And that is noise. So when we're practicing silence and going into silence, it's the same thing as returning to the self and going into who I really am. And it's not that easy because you actually don't know who you are. And the um, purpose of studying spiritual knowledge and practicing meditation is to... Um, pass along a, a way that takes you to yourself. And then every so often you can grasp yourself and say, yeah, okay, I got it. This is me. And you make a commitment. Yeah, I will be me. I will stay me. And I will not allow any of these other people or circumstances to take me away from myself. But they're good at it, they've been doing it for a long time, they plan on continuing, and you may not be so good at resisting it or being your actual self, um, because many people will use different forms of manipulation, um, which are part and parcel of certain um, uh, cultures and social uh, setups. Um, and, and I think this word setup is a very good one for that. And you, you come into the society of people who think that way and they look at you through that filter and they have ways to force you into that role. And you have to develop ways to not get forced into that role, which is usually one of diminishing yourself or um, denying yourself to yourself or doubting yourself. So a lot of this self-doubt and so on is actually imposed by external 
forces, uh, groups, uh, people, education systems, um, institution of religion, institution of the family, institution of the military, or whatever institution you happen to be in. And um, it's all about not allowing a person to be themselves. Whereas um, spiritual um, realization, you can say, of the self is uh, to be the self, uh, who you are, and stick with that, and against all odds. So what I'm saying is going into silence is a skill, and it's very active. Uh, but it's very secret because all of it is done in your mind. And moment by moment, you are recognizing the different games that are going on and you are playing your shots in such a way that you win, which means that you remain who you are and no one is allowed to, or you don't allow anyone to take you away from who you are. And this is called being free from influences. And influences are very powerful. They will trigger memories and um, uh, all, all of this is um, connected with how you were raised, how all the different conditioning that you have had. Uh, which um, consciously or unconsciously took you away from yourself. And some people, um, their problem is they were diminished from who they are. Others, their problem is that they think they're the latest, greatest thing when actually they're nothing special. And yet they really believe they are super, super. <laughs> They want everybody to, um, you know, uh, give them accolades, and and so they will throw their ego around, and so you you get um, lots of different dynamics between different personalities, all of whom are not themselves, and so that's your context. That's the noise that's on the outside of your body that you experience through your sense perception. And it's also on the inside of your being because you've been conditioned and there's all of these memories and um, uh, tendencies and uh, responses that you have been trained to have, which are nothing to do with who you are, but you have been so heavily trained, like a dog <laughs> or something like that, uh, because the human, human world likes to do that to each other. And so silence is very connected with freedom the freedom to be you. So especially in the United States, where most of us are uh, today, we are very aware about freedom. And um, we have this expression, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that can be interpreted on many levels. And at the most spiritual level, uh, is really connected with this practice of silence. So you can just think for a moment of some of the ways in which you get um, pulled into um, behaviors that you have been trained to believe are you, um, but that they're not really you and yet they can be triggered and you get pulled into them just like that. But the thing about meditation and being internally directed and quiet is that you make contact with the real self and this connection with your real self 
makes you very uncomfortable about the fact that you um, got triggered by some trigger which got you to behave in a way that doesn't correspond to who you know you really are deep down on the inside. And then you realize that it is stronger than you. So you have to do something about it. And a very good way to do something about it is to notice it whenever it happens and to sit with that and analyze carefully how you fell into it, how it had power over you, how it, it triggered you. Uh, one uh, very gross example of how this works is the, the practice of torture, but not, not that many people uh, get officially tortured, but a lot of people speak about mental torture. And um, this is that people will uh, know your weak points, and they will be abusive to you around those weak points, either by verbal abuse, or emotional abuse, or physical abuse. Um, but most of it is verbal abuse. And they will browbeat you with this, or they will put you in circumstances where you suffer. And then you will do some behavior to minimize the pain that they are giving you. And this behavior will be against who you are. And, and this is why this kind of abusive behavior is really very damaging. And it takes a lot of effort and time to come out of it. Some people are more abused, some people are less abused, but everybody has had some kind of situation where uh, they get um, ill-treated in a situation where the person who's ill-treating them has the authority to do that, and you can't protect yourself so well. You have to be really in your power to actually be you when you're in a difficult situation like that. And if it's been going on your whole life, then that's a big deal to come out of. But this practice of silence, which means you connect with who you are, and you spend time with who you are, so that it's quite clear to you who you are. And then you practice by going into situations where you know people look at you as something that you're not. Um, they may be prejudiced against you for one reason or another, your skin color, your uh, class, your caste, your whatever it happens to be. And people look at each other through all these filters and then they treat each other according to the filter. And then you kind of get pulled into that false identity. But when you're close to yourself, really being who you are, and then you go consciously into the company of someone who you know is going to be horrible to you or uh, talk down to you or something like this. Um, and then just practice to not really pay much attention to what they're doing, but really pay attention to how you are, how you feel, where what they do gets to you. Sometimes they'll take you by surprise. Um, sometimes you have a particular principle or value that you live by, and they may accuse you of being the opposite of that. And their accusation may destabilize you. And then you get a doubt, or maybe they're right. And what that means is you give away your power and you let them take over uh, your sense of self. 
and that that's a very serious mistake. Um, and a lot of the conditioning is about preventing people from being able to be their own selves and defend themselves against this kind of um, manipulation. Uh, so the whole thing of silence is to be able to see it, um, see it playing out and play your part so that they are unsuccessful in manipulating you or making you feel bad about yourself or any of that. Because when they succeed, um, you betray yourself. And this self-betrayal um, actually triggers a lot of negative thinking or what we call waste thinking. And, and what this does is it drains away all your power. And this is very noisy stuff. And when you practice to not speak, uh, it's actually extremely counterproductive. You have to be able to stand up for yourself and speak for yourself and um, become very skilled in taking control of the situation so that you are the master. And silence will help you with that. Silence means to affirm who you are, no matter what anybody says. <clears throat> and the key of the manipulation is to make you doubt yourself or make you think that you're um, not as good as them, something like this. These are just games that people play. And you need to know the games and um, not buy into them or get caught up in them. And this is a skill that needs a lot of time and attention and so on to learn. So a very important element of that is affirming yourself, who you are to yourself, so that you are um, again and again in contact with yourself. Then you go out through a sense organ, a sense perception, something's going on in the world, you decide what you're going to pay attention to, how important it is. Everything is about you. And the way most people get uh, uh, trained is everything is about everybody else. And they will say, well, if you're a good person, you will be compliant. And actually, that's not true. If you're a weak person, you will be compliant. If you're a good person, you will go along with what you decide to go along with and not, if not, that means you're in your power. So silence and being who you are, silence and being in your power is all one thing. And silence doesn't mean that you just shut down or check out or something like this. No. Silence is you are who you are. You are with yourself. And in any circumstance, you are the center of the universe. And you observe the performance of whatever's going on. And you position yourself where you judge is the suitable position to take in terms of what's going on. You don't have to be center stage all the time or even much of the time, but you have to decide. You're going to be in the middle, on the side, in the back, in the front. Um, you can make yourself disappear. You can make yourself the focus of attention. Any of this, uh, depending on the needs of the circumstance and for that you need good judgment and you need good perception to understand because there's a game going on all the time there's a game and um, you need to understand okay what's the game here and um, what what 
part do I need to play here so that the outcome of the game is the best for everyone concerned? And then you're not a pawn in the game. You don't want to be a pawn in the game. And so if you try to diminish yourself or just close down or something like this, you're really not going to be in your power. You're just going to be physically silent or you're going to be socially silent. But that is really to betray who you are. You don't have to be outspoken. You don't have to be aggressive. Um, aggression is a sign of somebody who's not really in control of themselves. Uh, silence is to be in control of yourself, having understood who you are. So being in control of yourself is like you are the master and you can do what you want, when you want, if you want, how you want, for as long as you want, and it will be the right thing at the right time. So this is also called precision thinking, precision feeling, or um, in an expression that was used in our class earlier today, accurate thinking, accurate thoughts, accurate words, accurate actions, the right thing at the right time, because you are who you are. And to be in that state, you have to be balanced. And someone balanced is someone silent. So we're not talking about physical silence at all, but uh, sometimes people don't really quite get it because they, they think, well, silence means physical silence. And that's very good, physical silence, no problem. But what we're doing here is something else spiritual silence, silence of the mind, stillness, balance, a readiness. Um, you're alert, you're aware of all the different levels of whatever's going on. And then by your own choice, you come into action and you are not um, influenced by or triggered by all the other people who are around. This is the practice of silence. So I'm going to take a moment um, to uh, maybe come back to Elizabeth, um, but I think that we would like to have a few minutes of a meditation that can help us to be internally, spiritually silent and still and um, unmoving. It's rather like a, a candle, a candle flame, which is still and steady. And that's only possible where there's no wind. And in terms of the spirit, the wind that moves that candle flame is feelings and emotions. And your feelings and emotions arise from associations, from thoughts, from what you see, what you hear. Everything is a trigger for something. And yet you hold yourself still and steady like an unwavering candle flame. And an emotion may be, um, may be raised by something that you remember or you feel. And you just let that energy of that feeling pass through you. You don't suppress it. You acknowledge it. But it doesn't rule you. Something someone says may be calculated to destabilize you. You catch it. You hold your position. You sit on your seat of self-regard, self-honor. And you say, okay, all right, 
that was interesting. Have a nice day. I'm not going to be uh, disturbed by that. I am the master of myself. And you let your attention go deep inside so you can feel yourself. You find yourself. You find the vibration that is the real you and you stay with that. You can hold that steady for a while. There are things going on, people around, but your attention is on the self. I am me and that's that. Do not try to please people because that's the same as giving away your power. Doesn't mean that you're selfish, but you are with the self. And when you are with the self, authentically, deeply, in a real way, then also you are with the Supreme Being. You are with the one who is truth when you are true to yourself. Many things come to take you away, but every time you return back to base, back to yourself, the still, stable, steady being of light. Your individuality is yours. You have your own vibration. your own sense of self, your own value. Everyone is different and you are you. So it's very important to give time to just be. Don't have to do anything. But you have the right to be. So cultivate that, grow that, expand and extend that. Fill the atmosphere around you with who you are and establish your aura wherever you go. Om Shanti. Thank you. Wow, that was... Um really uh, beautiful it just morphed into a lovely commentary massaging the soul with that balance discernment judgment power you know when i was listening to your words sister denise um i totally understood what you were saying and I could even resonate with what you were saying and identify with those triggers. Um, and I, I do see uh, where, you know, stillness speaks is the, I like that term. Um, it speaks volumes. However, 
I still, I just feel like I have, or perhaps this is an excuse that I have history. I have this pattern and I, you know, I, um, <clears throat> whatever the, I don't want to even say triggers, but just overthinking. And I to I see it. It's just overthinking and, um, how to clean house. I mean, you gave wonderful insights on what is needed, <laughs> but how to clear the intellect or the mind. Well, I think it's very important to um, separate yourself from all the messages that you have received which tell you you have to be like this and you can't be like that and on and on and on and that's endless and um and you need to um notice the incredibly large extent to which you are under the influence of this training and conditioning and you need to say no to it because it's like a drug. And um, that's not okay. If you think it's okay, then you'll allow it to be. But as soon as you think and you realize that it has taken you away from yourself so that you can be um, under the influence of somebody else who wants you to be a certain way, but not wants you to be you because they don't want you to be in your power because if you're in your power then they don't have any power over you, but actually they don't need any power over you. You don't need somebody to have power over you. And, um, and, and many people, they just don't get it. They don't realize the extent to which all of this training, conditioning, socializing and so on and so forth has actually taken you away from yourself. So I think the moment you realize it, that's when you say, oh my God, I have betrayed myself. I have allowed myself to be taken over. I've allowed myself to be molded by somebody else and bent out of shape. And then I'm not my real self. I'm not true to myself. That's terrible. I can't allow that anymore. Once you realize that, then you start to return to the self and find the self, and then you have to stand up for the self and represent the self and be the self. And that's to do with being in your power. And that's a tricky thing because, um, you know, most people are, are in social environments where somebody wants to be the top dog and everybody else has to be the bottom dogs. And that's not really how humanity is set up, but um, that's how people have decided that should be like this and actually not. So uh, it's a big piece of work. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever we notice I'm overthinking, just note to self, I've allowed somebody to take me over and uh, show them the door, mm -hmm. you know, because whatever is triggering that overthinking, it comes from something that's not you. And, and in our uh, spiritual language, we call it pariah. And pariah means something that's not you. And in English, we use the word pariah for something bad, something not good, somebody horrible and whatever. But it also can be used for anything that's not you. Mm. And um, so we have um, unsuspectingly, in good faith, allowed all kinds of influences, which we thought were beneficial and good and so on and so forth. And, and maybe in some cases it has been, but at the same time, um, it has, uh, made us betray ourself and um, not root for the self, not stand up for the self, but to um, uh, uh, allow others to be in charge of us. And uh, that's 
that means we can't be ourselves anymore. And that means we can't be silent. But because sometimes there's always deep inside, there's the real self who says, uh, get off my back. Let me be me. You, you've followed my train of thought. There's that, <laughs> there's that voice. And then there's the, the other voice that's afraid. When you want so much to be your real authentic self, but then there's a fear. And of course, then there's addictions, as you mentioned. So then how uh, we have some questions, if I may go to that questions. Mm -hmm. And any of you are most welcome to put your questions in the chat. And if you feel um, comfortable, you can also raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask personally. Um, right now we have how the question is, how would you describe your deepest, strongest experience of the power of silence? What do you feel, see, and experience in that state? Um, well, I have had a few experiences over the years, and the kind of internal voices are, this is me, or ah, this is what it's like to be me, and so you get it, because there's so many things that take you away from yourself and you just don't like being whatever that is. So you don't feel comfortable, but you don't even know because you don't have something to compare it with. But once you've experienced, ah, this is what it's like to be me. And wow, the best thing of all is that I am me. It gives you a kind of strength that throws all that stuff that sits on your back like a monkey, you know, and uh, and you throw it off and you become free and it keeps trying to come back on. And the thing about fear, I think it's very important because um, people who want to control you uh, do so by making you afraid of um, verbal abuse or of taunting or of um, being chucked out or um different kind of insults and you really need to say this is me and so what do you know there's a photograph i took of a statue which were which i saw in a field in northern france and it was just sitting there absolutely extraordinary and it was a a wooden statue of a pig and it was sitting on a fence, you know, with its crossed legs and sunglasses. And underneath it was a little um, plaque that said, so what? And I love that because that's what you need to do. Say, this is me. And if you don't like it, too bad, you know, because who are you to take me away from me? What do you think you're doing? This is me. And if you don't like it, have a nice day because you consult your conscience and everything about you is perfectly fine. But you're not under anybody's control. And um, you are raised in school, in church, in all of these places with finger wagging. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> they all want you to believe that you're not okay, you're a sinful soul, you're less than, you're bad person in one way or another and on and on and on endlessly so that you know it's um it's conditioning and it's training and it's toxic and to come out of it is a big piece of work but just these moments that you get in meditation of connecting to who you are and then you have to have a commitment i will be me and all these people who want to try and manipulate me out of it, I will use them as opportunities to get more skilled. And that's why they're there. You know? So the, the center of your universe is you. That's important. On that note, there's a question here um, from Dodi. What would be a good example of playing the game? N not as a pawn, and not staying quiet, but speaking up for highest good in a challenging situation. 
Well, it's not possible for me to give you an example of that because any example is exactly the same as, oh my God, there's a green elephant standing at the traffic light and a mouse is walking by, what should I do? You know, <laughs> there is no green elephant, there's no mouse. It's all anything hypothetical. Do not even think about answering a question like that. It's much better to take an actual situation and talk about it, but maybe we don't have time for that. But there are occasions where we would have time to look at somebody's actual situation with all the details about it and how that person acted and so on. And actually best is you do it for yourself. Because with hindsight, after an incident has happened, you know, you, you replay your memory of it and you look at it from a number of different angles, and then you um, imagine, well, if I had done it like this, how would it have been? If I had done it like that, how could it have been different? And in that way, you analyze it very um, usefully, and then you prepare yourself for the next performance when something like that comes along. That is, um, wow, that is really amazing. I really like that. And I mean, that really tops that saying, don't buy into the story. Well, mm -hmm. don't even give it the power that it's, <laughs> you know, this hypothetical ideas, they really just create fear, don't they? Wow, I really love that. Um, on that note, uh, let's see, um, I have Jagit Singh who would like to ask a question. Do you have the... Two people's view. Oh, you want me to be there? Well, yes. Okay. <laughs> if you're not there, then what? Okay. Ah, uh, so yeah. much better. <laughs> Put myself together here. Oh, yeah. um, Great. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to play my role, but I also, uh, I just didn't want to, you know, make a thing of it. But yes, it's nice to be here with you. And, um, I'm really taking a lot of benefit. Do you know when a class is really good? Do you all feel like um, it's intended for you, especially? <laughs> good. Yeah. And that's okay. You know, make light of it and just go, okay, thank you. You know, I was ready to hear it. So I'm owning my end of the deal. Okay. And we have Jagat Singh here who has a question and... Um, do you, I think you are unmuted? Yes. Okay. Yes. Th th thanks, sisters. Um, sister, you talked about control, manipulation, abuse. Um, let's take that into parent children perspective where ch parents are trying to so called quote unquote discipline the children. Sometimes the parents may not be aware of their limits. And especially when I was growing up as a child, people, parents used to even hit the children. Where do you, where do you draw a line where discipline is discipline and uh, when the line is crossed, it becomes abuse, manipulation or control? Well, you know, the problem is people do to their children what their parents did to them. And it was very much the way of, how to do things, which was created by the religions and the military and all these people who decided that children are about the same as dogs and they need to be trained and they're basically bad. And if you love them too much, there's something wrong with you. And all that is um, a kind of um, social uh, mystery that I don't know when it came in, but it came in and it was not very good and it had been there for a long, long time. And uh, I think a, a good thing that's happening now is a lot of stuff is getting exposed and um, a lot of people are working on deep injuries and traumas that occur through just basic uh, toxic parenting. 
and and there's a lot of study of this and 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 people uh, do psychological work and therapy and all of these things so that we are actually much more knowledgeable about these things than we used to be and we do not treat each other like um you know uh, uh something to be named and blamed and shamed and beaten into shape uh, because um, all it does is is make a person violent and um, and and internally seriously damaged and so I think we've reached the peak of that and now ho hopefully uh, uh, many people many families and all are coming back from it and I think it happens a lot when people start to and have started to get interested in developing themselves spiritually um, because when you do spiritual work you also have to do psychological work and uh, um, when you do spiritual work you you are moving along a certain track where every so often you encounter some deep internal injuries and then you have to stop for a while and take care of them so that you can then move on and so, you know, if, you, if you're going to be a teacher of spirituality, you better be good and you better be knowledgeable because if you're not, you can, you know, be counterproductive. So um, it's so difficult to find people who are really, really good at their jobs, at <laughs> what to do. You know, we do our best, but yeah it's a really important thing that you bringing up. And uh, it's very useful, I think, to take up these type of topics, because it becomes a matter of conversation and a matter of self analysis. And, you know, there, there are just so many movies, so many books, so many um, uh, things that have been created by people who have got a good handle on it to um, describe to us what this is, that it's really very helpful. And, and it, it's all a matter of um, educating the self and, and taking advantage of different forums like this, where you can actually talk about stuff, which up until fairly recently had been pretty much taboo. And everybody said, no, 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 you know, but now it's, oh, yes, we better take a look at this. <laughs> Mm. Great. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you so much for your question, Jagit. Thank um, you. Here we have, um, once you have experience, uh, have that experience, when you feel you've got that, you know how I call it the ping feeling? Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> and for me, that means that I really feel a sense of myself. And um, and here it's saying, asking, once you have this experience of power and strength of silence. Secondly, how do you prolong this detached kind of, here it says thoughtless state, um, but perhaps it's good, I'm just gonna say how it's stated. How do, you, how do you sustain this state throughout the day and in life activities? Well, do not expect that you can make it miraculously stay there and displace what was there before, because it, it won't. You get a moment of capturing it. And like a butterfly, it flies away and disappears. And then you have to go after it and try really hard to get it back again. But um, at least you've had it and you've got a memory of it. So you can go back to that memory and continue to work because it will come to you from time to time and you get it. It doesn't come often, doesn't come always very strongly, but um, you will clock up more and more moments of being with yourself. And it's like, um, you know, you get a picture made of dots and you, you're really um, putting dots between the dots. So you have more time as yourself and less time taken away by all these influences. And, and in that way, you, you are building yourself up uh, through these insights and moments of connectedness and, and just keep on doing this inner work. And it's, um, 
it really needs to be a priority if this is what you want to achieve. So a uh, spiritual practice is not um, not really something that's just fun and games. <laughs> it's real work and it's subtle and it's deep. And um, so we just move forward with it. Well, I find that exciting it, in, because it, it's actually an invitation to live, yeah. to come alive. How fun and scary can that be? <laughs> Well, that's it. It is fun and scary. And so you have to be courageous and you have to be up for it. And if anybody doesn't like it, it's too bad. And if they really don't like it, it's still too bad. And if they do anything and everything possible to stop you from being who you are, be it anyway. And if you fall apart and put yourself back together again and carry on and yes, let's go. Well, we have... Um... Thank you for the questions. These are great. And one question here is uh, how to let go of the past. And that's a real culprit in change. Well, you know, these are your wounds. You carry your scars with you. The only way you can prove that you're a warrior is you've got scars. And if you don't have any scars, it means you don't have any experience. So, but they're not bleeding. And so that's good. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you you don't actually let go of the past. You you have your history. It's part of you, but um, how you relate to it is very important. And for you to see it in a positive light is also very important. You see, there when you experience trauma and shaming and blaming and uh, all the horrible things that happen to people that they never tell anyone. And, um, you know, the world can carry on like that because they know nobody's going to tell. But now people are starting to say, me too, me too, me too, me too. And then the result is, hey, you can't do that anymore. So that's good. And uh, so your past experiences are... Um, on one level, you went through hell, but on another level, they, um, they can make you compassionate towards others who have been through the whole thing, because otherwise people are really mean to people like that, and they become holier than thou and this sort of thing, because they deny their own traumas. So that's one good thing. Another is that you you build through that, you build a certain toughness, you build a certain resilience. And once these things are processed in a very positive way, that you take you take out the shame, you take out the um, feeling that if this happened to me, it means that I deserved it. No, that's a piece of nonsense, you know, that the social conditioning feeds into people and that if something bad happened to you well you deserved it what no who said that that was no good it didn't it happened it happened you know like a car accident it happened you know maybe somebody did something bad but there are things that happen and you just have to say okay it happened and why did it happen there's one very amazing piece of the teachings of Raj Yoga that I really like for this. It happened for two reasons. One, to make you strong. And two, to make you experienced. And it didn't happen for any other reason. Wow. And then you can say, all right, that's good. Let's go. Because this, okay, let's go, is just a really important feeling to have as you deal with things bit by bit, you see? We have a question from uh, where, in the room where I am here. Okay. From Kalyani. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sister Jimmy. I have a question where, uh, where uh, we are in a meeting and everybody wants to be themselves, but in an organization or any situation, there are some tasks that nobody want to do because they want to stay on their choices. And uh, we were taught 
that mold yourself and do it instead of creating a situation but then how do you stay on yourself or uh, because you mold yourself first time but the situation arises all the time and still the same thing happens then how to teach people well um molding yourself and making yourself um you know the person that everybody can use and if necessary abuse to do what everything every whatever they don't want to do which may be part of your conditioning you know which may be not part of the other people's conditioning but they're always really happy when there's somebody who's ready to mold and do whatever nobody wants to do but then you have to say wait a minute <laughs> this is not quite right here and whatever your conditioning was you have to question it and say that that doesn't apply in all situations that applies sometimes and then you have to take charge and you decide when to do and when to not do and it's all about affirming yourself and standing up for yourself and demanding equitability because otherwise you just be a doormat and you see in many cultures women and girls are trained to be that you know which means it's very convenient for the men but it's not equitable and it doesn't result in a harmonious relationships and so you have to say this conditioning belongs to the 15th century but it's not very useful in the 21st century so i need to catch up with the times you know that's, that's lovely yeah so it's in a way you're it's an invitation i like the word equitable um, let me add, uh, it's like saying this is a win-win. Yeah. Um, it's not about perpetrator and victim and savior. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, it, that doesn't work anymore or it never really worked, but now we're onto it. These, these games. Yeah, I, I think it's good. You know, there is an evolution going on, a very important evolution happening, and we are very much part of it because we have an advantage. We have spiritual information that nobody has. I mean, nobody knows that silence is nothing to do with not talking. <laughs> Just don't, you know. They don't know what is stillness of the mind. They don't know that you can be quiet and strong they think strong means aggressive but for us aggressive means scattered and fragmented you know so we have this incredible advantage of knowledge that other people don't have we have an incredible advantage of knowing how to connect with the source and take energy because that energy enables us to be who we are um in a in a stable strong sustainable way and that's because there is this internal strength that's get getting accumulated and we are risking to be ourselves and if you don't ever take any risk you don't ever get anywhere right do you isn't that such a tempting invitation <laughs> I mean, isn't that lovely, people? I mean, are you willing to risk being yourself? <laughs> That's the thing. Mm. I I, I uh, really appreciate that, um, and I, and we're getting some comments of yeah, I feel the same way. Um, Good. Uh, now, someone saying quiet is the new loud. Okay, um, and and one is also saying I'm learning. So we really understand this, we really get it. And this is something to ponder through the week um, and nourish ourselves to strengthen. Thank you so much. Is anyone else have a question before we let Sister Denise go <laughs> and all of you? Yeah, a new message, let's see. 
Okay, someone saying I'm learning a lot and so happy. I'm I have a spiritual family. Well, we'll just finish with that. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Sister Denise. It's just delightful. And thank you everyone for joining us. And please come back next Tuesday and we'll dive deeper into these aspects of spiritual development. Om Shanti. So let's close with a moment of silence. And honor this time we've had together. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs>